my patient questions. Sorry, I'm just going to snag that. Um, so usually a patient will come to somebody with a, like a practitioner with a question and you know, you may not know or you want to make sure that your information is current. You look into it, you apply the knowledge that you found, and then you make your decision based on that. Um, so it's, it's not just a, oh, I know what to do about this. It's making sure that you're at, uh, what you're doing is backed up by evidence. Um, and that any evidence that you look at, you critically appraise it and make sure it's, it's of a quality that you would like to use in your work. Um, and this applies not just to patient care, but also to uh, policy decisions, things like that mm -hmm. as well. Um, so you, and it, you can't always just rely on evidence. You have to bring in your own clinical expertise and you need to look at the patient values and preferences. Uh, for whatever reason, something may not work for them. Um, so we can see here a three-legged approach to how to go about using evidence-based medicine or, um, or evidence-based practice, which it has expanded into over the years. And there are many fields that use evidence-based practice, including librarianship. Mm -hmm. um, and just a quick note about feasibility. Even though your best practice may be evidence-based and you may not be able to do it, it may be too expensive, it may just uh, not be feasible for any other reason and so but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't know what the best evidence available is um, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep track of it because costs change your access changes yeah. uh, the and so getting back to the question that we asked earlier on um, why do we use evidence to inform decisions and we've got a little Dilbert cartoon here um, <laughs> I need three bitter and unsuccessful scientists and a hundred lazy journalists. Very good. Did you know toddlers thrive on pollution? Which definitely sounds true, and toddlers absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you want to make sure that the information you're giving out is, is quality and, and based on something, not just somebody's Agenda. Somebody's agenda. For instance, there may be some companies that think it would be great to have news stories talking about how, how great pollution is for toddlers, um, but <clears throat> of course it's not the case. Um, so you guys all in your responses talked about how, it's, how evidence is critical to making sure that you have quality decisions. So this, we're going to be talking about this. This is the evidence-based medicine pyramid. Um, and so at the bottom there, you can see there's background and expert opinion all the way to the top. Systematic reviews, which are the, the highest quality of evidence. Um, we'll return to this in just a moment. But historically, we're going to talk about uh, what was used before. And, and expert opinion was really what has been used, what was used in the past uh, before the introduction of evidence-based medicine, especially in a, in a very formulated way. And, you know, there, there are varying degrees of this. People tried to incorporate evidence throughout the years, but it wasn't a policy the way it became in, in 1992. Um, and going even farther back, you could see how relying on evidence-based or um, relying on expert opinion instead of evidence-based medicine could be a problem. Um, there, back in the back in ancient Rome, <laughs> there was a, uh, a very talented anatomist named Galen, um, and his work became uh, the gold standard of, of medical and anatomy textbooks for centuries. Um, but he lived in a time where it was extremely illegal to dissect a human, and so a lot of his findings were sort of best guesses. He said, uh, humans had lobed livers. Well, they don't, but dogs do. Um, but then this was, this was used for centuries, and so even though eventually people were able to dissect humans, and they looked at, they opened up the corpse and looked inside and said, oh dear, this one doesn't have a lobed liver, but Galen says he does. Well, clearly this is some sort of freak of nature, 
instead of assessing the information, the evidence in front of them. Um, and so, I, like, ancient Rome sounds like a long time ago, but Galen's teaching were u was used until the 1600s, even in some cases until the 1800s. So, evidence, it's important, guys. <laughs> Well, and correcting from, uh, you know, past understanding, yeah. trying to learn, relearn information over old things that you've already learned. Yeah. It's hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's important to to be able to criticize what has been doctrine before. Yeah. Um, so if we return to the uh, evidence-based pyramid, we can see that there are sort of, there's background information, expert opinion, um, which does still matter. It is important to have this this background learning, this information within within your own understanding. Um, and then we see unfiltered information, so individual studies, uh, the, the top of which are randomized controlled trials, which we'll be talking about in more detail here. Um, and then we have filtered information, which are syntheses of various studies, putting them together, saying like, okay, consistently, what are we finding in these studies? And systematic reviews are the top of the top of that. So let's ask our first poll question. Okay. Which is, so, what is a systematic review? We'll launch our poll here. Uh, yeah, so we'd like you, it'll pop up on the screen in a moment there. And if you guys could just answer that poll for us. That would be great. Okay, so almost everyone has voted, waiting on a couple more. Okay, last chance to vote. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Okay, we'll close, close that poll. poll. So it looks like a, a pretty close split between those that can describe what a systematic review is and those that, that have heard with it and only a couple of people that um, are not currently familiar with systematic reviews. So we, uh, so a systematic review is something that attempts to collate all empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. So what this means is basically that a question has set to be answered early, well in advance, and that um, specific evidence has been sought that will answer that question. So that's very different than sometimes when we think like, oh, okay, I'd like to learn a little bit more about something. And then you start kind of digging around and you learn all kinds of little tidbits about uh, a multitude of different things. A systematic review is far more precise and it says, does this evidence, like this evidence might be really great, it might be really interesting, but does it answer my specific question? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. And that question has to be set well in advance so that it can't change over time um, or as you kind of go along. As you find more information, well maybe this is the question I should have been asking instead. No. Yeah, so it really um, it really sets out with that uh, that eligibility criteria up front and that pre-specified question, um, and so we've got a definition here, and this is from the Cochrane Handbook, and again it's based on the evidence that came out in the early '90s, and a systematic review um, also is systematic in its methods. And this is really key because having systematic methods helps to minimize any kind of bias. And when you minimize bias, then your findings are more reliable. So the characteristics of a systematic review are that there is a clearly stated set of objectives, again with that predefined eligibility criteria. And so that might be things like, are we talking about what age group are we talking about? Um, maybe if we're talking about a drug, what dose are we talking about? Uh, there are any kind of um, uh, eligibility criteria like that that you can set in advance so that you can't slip in something that might not, uh, that might sort of um, change the results of what you're looking at. Uh, also, the systematic review 
um, has explicit and reproducible methodology. And this is as with any good um, scientific aspect. You want something that you can uh, specifically describe what exactly you did to the extent that somebody else could go and replicate it. The search, our favorite part, um, is a really important part or really the foundation to the systematic review. And this is when librarians um, go out and do a systematic search. And so again, we're creating a search where we can um, specifically describe how and why we use certain search terms. Um, and, uh, you know, whereas sometimes when we do searches for you, we'll put in a search term and go, okay, well, this term is kind of relevant to what they're talking about. This might have some good stuff. And then we'll go from getting 30 results to 3,000 3, results, and we'll say, oh, well, we'll, we'll just take this one out. That's too many results. Whereas in a systematic search, um, if that search term meets your criteria, then it has to remain in the search regardless of whether it retrieves um, too many results or not. Yeah. So the result, the search results that you'll get in systematic reviews will be thousands and thousands of results, and that's what you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, and next is there's an assessment of the validity of the results. So sometimes we'll take a great uh, or um, an article and it'll be published in a peer review journal and we'll go, oh great, this is something that I rely on. But in a systematic review, you'll have somebody on the team um, that really goes through that methodology and says, well, can we really, did they apply the proper methodology? Did they make the right conclusions? Can we trust their sample size? And they're really assessing the um, validity of those findings. And then finally, it's the presentation of the results. So they're presented in a way that we can understand what people did and why they did it. Uh, now, if we were in person, we would ask you if you'd ever heard of Cochrane. Um, and feel free to you know, have, make any comments or put your questions into the chat box. So the Cochrane Collaboration, um, their systematic reviews are the gold standard currently of systematic reviews. And the key reason is that their methods are the most robust and systematic. So to get your, um, get your systematic review into the Cochrane library, you have to um, write your protocol and have that put in the Cochrane library first. And that basically shows Cochrane and everybody else that you've already thought through and established your criteria and your methods well in advance and that you're not going to sort of change them as you go because you're not happy with the results you find or with the number of results, those kinds of things. And also that your team is an appropriate team. You've mm -hmm. got the appropriate uh, specialist Expertise on your yeah. team. Uh, Cochrane is a larger organization than just uh, the Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews. And uh, so you can check them out at cochrane.org. And they have um, teams of subject expertise all over the world. And there is Cochrane Canada as well. Uh, and they, particularly in um, the areas of medicine in particular, that have huge, huge uh, data sets like um, heart, cancer, uh, bone, um, they've got groups all over the country that pull together all the experts and they keep repositories of all of the randomized control trials that sort of that exist. Uh, Cochrane Library, as a note, it's free to search. And you can see their plain language summaries and their abstracts for free. If you ever want a full text, um, then contact us and we can send it to you. Yeah. As ever, don't pay for anything that's behind a paywall. Just contact us and we'll, we'll send it to you instead. So in a, good, um, in a good systematic review, they'll have what's called a Prisma diagram. And I know that uh, the text on this slide might be getting a little bit tiny for you. Uh, and we will be sending out the slides after today's presentation. Um, and then you'll be able to zoom in. But the premise here is that in the top box, that it identifies that in this systematic review, they started with 5,828 records that were identified through databases. And it breaks down by which database identified how many, um, how many references. And then in the top box beside it, it says that they also identified seven references from checking reference lists and nine references um, that the reviewers knew about but that weren't captured in, um, through the database searching. 
So that start is the start of this review and how they, uh, all of the references that they started with. And then throughout the course of the review, they tracked those 5,828 references plus the seven plus the nine. Do that math quick. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, so they screen through all of those, and usually a title abstract, uh, usually the first stage of screening is title abstract. So two independent reviewers will look at the titles and abstracts, and they'll say, yes, this may be relevant to our study, or no, this is not relevant. Uh, and in this review, they got down to, or first they um, screened for duplicates, and then they reviewed those titles and abstracts, and that got them down to 155 uh references that they screened the full text of. So they went from about 6,000 references down to 155. They reviewed the full text, and in some cases they knew for sure that those studies were relevant, and in other cases they couldn't tell from the title and abstract, and not everything has an abstract, mm -hmm. so sometimes they just have to go by the title. And of those 155, then 142 were discarded, uh, which left them with 12 studies. And then that's when their epidemiologist or their biostatistician or their expert in methods then went through those 12 included studies and said, what kind of data is in here that I can pull out to aggregate? And what, kind, and what kinds of conclusions did they make based on this data and is it appropriate? So in any good systematic review, you'll see a PRISMA diagram uh, so that you'll be able to track and see um, how many references they started with, where they got them from, when they excluded them, all that kind of stuff. So we've got here uh, of 12 quick steps of a systematic review, and we present these for two reasons. The first reason is in case you were thinking about doing a systematic review, and the other is in case uh, you're reading a systematic review and you want to get a sense of whether it's any good or not, because um, uh, systematic reviews are very, very attractive to researchers. One, because they are the highest level of um, evidence, uh, so they look great on a CV. Um, and two because, <laughs> two, because they don't require a lot of funding, and also because they don't require ethics. So what we've seen in the last decade or more is a lot of people do systematic reviews for the wrong reasons. They want to do it for the, in quotes, prestige aspect, um, and not because it's the best way to answer a question. So a little bit when you're looking at a systematic review, be a little bit wary of did they do this review for the right reasons, and is it any good? So uh, the 12-step process is, is there a need for this systematic review? Um, and then to assemble the team. So we've already indicated that you need at least one librarian to run your search for you. You need a methods expert, like a biostatistician or an epidemiologist. You need a minimum of two content experts uh, to assess um, the content. So at minimum, you'll want a team that has four people on it. And uh, now there are some exceptions, but that's a really great way of, if you see something that has systematic review in the title, and it only has one or two authors, your alarm bells um, should be sounding right there. You should Probably be making a crinkle a face. Yeah. Make a crinkle face like Maureen just did. Um, and it doesn't mean that for certain that you should uh, just throw it aside. You can take a look at it, but just be wary of what, um, of what it really is. The third thing is um, that you want to develop your question. Uh, and again, this is something that you want to have early on and to then form the whole rest of your review based on that question that you developed initially. And then you want to determine your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Sometimes this is really simple, like you're only going to include children of a certain age or, or any kind of age, um, any other kind of certain demographic, maybe it's only a certain kind of study that you want to look at. Uh, there's all kind of, um, uh, and again, if it's a drug, maybe it's dosing, if it's an, an intervention, maybe it's rolled out by a certain group, um, uh, all kinds of things that you want to include as your include-exclude. Next, you develop your protocol, and this is often where a lot of people um, fall short, so we get some knocks on our doors where people say, okay, we're doing a systematic review, and we say, great, we're happy to help, let's see your protocol, and they look at us kind of funny, and we then... Um, we'll send you back to work on, on the protocol first. Uh, because until that protocol is developed, we don't want to start searching because it is uh, an extremely robust search that we create. 
and we want any kinds of um, contemplations to have happened before we start entering any search terms. It's not a good systematic review if it keeps changing yeah. while you're doing it. Yeah. So next is to review the results once you've done the search and taken out any duplicates. Then that's when um, those, now in some reviews they just have title abstract screening and then full text. Other reviews, if it's a larger data set, they might just do titles first and then title abstract and then, um, then title abstract method section. Uh, there might be a number of different um, steps in their reviewing of the results. Then you uh, have your experts extract the data. You assess the quality of those studies. Then you're analyzing that data. You write up the review and then right before you send it off to the publisher, then you want to update the search. Um, because uh, uh, in the time it took you to do all of that reviewing and analyzing, a lot of time has passed and uh, you want to do a quick search before, um, in case anything new has been published. So there's also a whole ton of other kinds of reviews. We call them the zoo of reviews. There's 14 different kinds. Um, if you're interested in knowing about these, uh, we've got a great link to a resource that sort of outlines what they all are. So sometimes, again, this comes back to that premise of is a systematic review the best way to approach this question? Or do we want a rapid review or a scoping review or just a literature review? So there's many different kinds. Um, some of them, like a literature review, the methodology is not as robust. Uh, it's not as systematic. Sometimes in a rapid review, uh, you might still have a robust methodology, but you might... Um, you not, just need a faster answer. You just need a faster answer. <clears throat> so if you're considering a systematic review, our take home, if you take anything away from today, please take home that systematic reviews take a lot of time. So we often will have... Um, medical students come to us in, in May, at the beginning of May, and say, hey, I'm doing a research project this summer, I'm doing a systematic review, and uh, I'm going to have it you know, published, ready to submit for publication in September. And we say, we're very sorry, but no, you're not. Um, because it just takes, uh, takes more time with that. And an, the average time for a review with an experienced team is a year. Um, most take much longer, and that's part of the reason why really established organizations like Hadith are looking at these rapid reviews for um, instances where they do need the information faster than that. Uh, again, the caveat of do a systematic review because it's the most appropriate methodology, not because you just want to do a systematic review. Um, and systematic reviews also, they do need some money. Um, uh, citation management software, so again, to manage you know, thousands of references simultaneously and be able to track them um, throughout the whole course of the review, that takes uh, management software. Um, and you know, to buy a note for one person, it's you know, about $100. So we're not talking about huge budgets. Um, but sometimes if you have to hire a biostatistician or um, maybe some researchers uh, to help you do the screening, if you need to hire a librarian just to do that intensive search for that time, these things all cost money. And finally, uh, know your topic. So you don't want to find out three months into your project that there's a thousand RCTs uh, published on this topic or that there's uh, already a hundred systematic reviews already published. So to learn more, uh, the Cochrane Handbook is very, very detailed. Maureen usually laughs here and rolls her eyes and says like it's very, very detailed. Quite long. <laughs> it's quite long, um, but if you want to know step by step how to do a systematic review and how to systematically um, do each step, this is definitely the best source. The Joanna Briggs Institute um, is uh, based out of the field of nurse. Oops, sorry, is based out of the field of nursing um, because systematic reviews are great for quantitative information, but not for qualitative. So they've developed some methodology specific to qualitative literature. And then here uh, at the Center for Healthcare Innovation, um, they offer two really great programs. One is a, a three-day workshop on a systematic review. And there's also a course, and it, usually, and it starts in January, um, and it's based out of the Community Health Sciences. Um, and it takes you over the course of the four-month course it really takes you into the ins and outs of how to actually do a systematic review. Yeah, and I believe there was an email about the workshop uh, 
this morning, mm. actually. So it's just in November. It's coming up right away if oh, you're great. interested in that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about clinical practice guidelines, but I see that there's a, a note in the comments that uh, I wasn't able to be heard before. So can you guys just confirm that you can hear me? I've got a bit of a sore throat, so I'm not 100% sure how loud I'm being. Um, so just... All right. Thanks, guys. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so clinical practice guidelines are one of the next levels of evidence that we're going to be talking about. Um, and they're, they're put out by organizations, governments. Uh, they're often standards that you use, that you work from when you're, you're working as a practitioner or as a policy developer in the healthcare field. Um, and the Institute of Medicine here defines them as statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient care that are informed by a systematic review of evidence and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternative care options. Um, and so we're just going to talk about, even though apparently they're, they're in that definition, they use the term informed by a systematic review. Well, if that's the case, why are they lower on the evidence pyramid than systematic reviews? And the... Oh, we're going to launch a poll. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. It's okay. There's a poll. Yep. There's a poll. You guys guess first. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll talk about why. <laughs> Thanks, Arv. It's okay. Okay, so you can just answer... Um, why you think or why you know guidelines are lower than systematic reviews on the evidence pyramid. Great, the answers are coming in. Okay, we've got... Oh. Wow, some smart some smart people on this, uh, smart and informed uh, people. So we're just, we've just closed the poll now. So it looks like uh, there's the top two answers are guidelines or expert opinion and not evidence. And guidelines may use many forms of evidence to, and may introduce bias. Um, and it's predominantly the guidelines may use many forms of evidence and may introduce bias. Um, their methodology is usually obscured from us. We usually don't know what's gone into the development of the guidelines. Um, also, depending on who's putting them out, the guidelines may be taking into consideration those feasibility concerns that we were talking about before. They may also have agendas. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully the organizations putting them out don't, but uh, some of them may well have agendas. Um, and also they may be geared towards the broadest population group, where if you're you know, this, this works for the majority of people, but if you have X condition, you should never be doing this, right? But you wouldn't put that in the guidelines for, yeah. for the population as a whole. Um, so that's just why they're lower down. Um, but the main, the main reason is that we don't always know what's gone into the creation of these guidelines. And uh, we don't always know what steps they've taken to reduce the bias. And that they do take multiple kinds of information, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so yeah. it's not just the, the randomized controlled trials, or it's not just, it may be, uh, it may involve more qualitative studies, it may involve more case studies even. So, um, so when do you, oops. When do you use guidelines? Um, you're u looking for guidelines when you're looking for a clinical recommendation, or when you know there's research available on the topic, or if you're looking to see what standards around the world are right now on a specific specific sort of topic. Um, so we're just going to talk briefly about where you can get them. Um, if you're looking for Canadian practice guidelines, uh, the CPG Infobase is probably the best source. Um, and this is free to search. Uh, it's created and maintained by the Canadian Medical Association. Um, and it's, both, it's bilingual, so French and English. Um, and it's, we'll just go into the next slide, which gives us a sense of what it looks like. It's not the most attractive database, but it's pretty straightforward. Searching in it, you just put in your keywords and they'll come up. It's sorted by relevance. So if you're not finding what you're looking for in the top 10, you may want to rejig your search or there may be no guidelines available in Canada for that. 
Um, so you can see on the slide here, if, you, if we put in vitamin D, which is what we did, then it's got these vitamin D guidelines here, and you can just click on them and, and view them. And most of the guidelines that they link to from this site are freely available, mm -hmm. the actual full text guidelines. But if ever you run into an instance where the full text is not available freely, then make sure you contact us and we'll send them to yeah. you. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so to give you a sense of what the guidelines look like, uh, here are seven of the top ten most accessed uh, clinical practice guidelines. Um, so they're, they tend to be about uh, the most common conditions that are out there, which is not really surprising, but like COPD and hypertension and um, diabetes and that sort of thing. So, and it just gives you an idea of, you know, it's, it's typically about management or about treatment. Um, another place where you can search for guidelines is the TRIP database, which we like quite a bit. We use it a lot. Um, it's a search it's the same sort of idea as CPG InfoBase. Um, it's worldwide. Um, and so it's international. And it includes several types of resources, uh, not all of which are freely available, but searching guidelines is. Um, so this is what it looks like. We did a search here for vitamin D in pregnancy. And you can see it, it comes up with quite a few results. And it's, it's searching everything. But on the right-hand side there, you can see that it's got this tab, guidelines, and then it's broken down into different areas. So we've just zoomed in on it here. Um, so there's Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK, USA, and other guidelines. So you can get a sense of where this information is coming from and, and that sort of thing. Um, Okay, uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Orvi, who's going to talk about randomized control trials, but let's see who knows what randomized control trials are. Good, so we're going to do a really quick poll here on, uh, and the question is, do you know what a randomized control trial is, an RCT? Okay, we're getting a bit quicker on our on our poll, so that's good, and I think we're kind of continuing that same um, trend. I'm going to close the poll. So most people said, uh, yes, they know uh, what an RCT is. Some people are saying, you know, I don't know a ton about them, and a couple of people have said, no, I've never heard of them. So um, uh, our real, you know, variation in our subset here. So a randomized control trial, we're now moving lower down the evidence pyramid, uh, and it's where participants are assigned by chance to separate groups. And neither the researchers nor the participants can choose which group they're in. So you'll see that as we zoom into our evidence pyramid, there's sort of a break you can see in the pyramid. Um, and uh, and we're now, now we're going between filtered information and unfiltered information. So systematic reviews, evidence synthesis, guidelines, article synopsis, those were all things that took multiple data sources and collated them into one thing. Um, now, as we're one step lower on that evidence pyramid, a randomized control trial is only about one thing. Um, and so that's, and the same as cohort studies and case control studies. So it doesn't collate multiple sources, it's, it's one study. But it's the best level of study. It's the best level of study. Um, so why would you use a randomized control trial? Uh, this would be to investigate a health intervention. And like I mentioned, um, it's assigning groups by chance. So one group receives the inter uh, one group receives the intervention, and you also need to ensure that the groups are the same at the start, that there's no difference between them. So we've got here this map of Winnipeg, and some of you might be quite familiar with it, um, even though I know, again, it'll be quite tiny. Um, but this is from the Manitoba Center for uh, Health Policy and it's tracking life expectancy of individuals based on where they live. And this study was one that they did all across the province of Manitoba. I just grabbed a snapshot of, um, of Winnipeg here. Uh, because if you live directly in the inner core of Winnipeg, so think Portage and Maine, um, then your life expectancy is 10 years less than if you live in the north part of Winnipeg. And if you instead traveled south, 
you um, you are 15 you you gain 15 years of life expectancy and so if we were designing a randomized control trial in Winnipeg um, it would not be okay if we said okay people at this clinic at Portage in Maine are getting the intervention and the people in the south end of Winnipeg are, are getting a controlled intervention uh, well we know that um, there's something different about people who live in the inner city than people who live in the south. So that would not be an effective randomization. Uh, and we would instead want to alternate. So half of, half of the people in each of those clinics get the intervention and half get the control. Um, and we hear there's lots of, st lots of stories about sort of failed randomization. One of my, one of my sort of favorite ones um, is uh, th this study was going on and it was about a, a new kind of surgical process uh, that was being done and they started no the researchers started noticing that um, that the people that were getting the intervention surgery were only occurring during the day and the control was only occurring during the night and they were thinking like well that is not an effective control what the heck is going on here and what would happen was that um, residents needed supervision to do the intervention and often at night they would be working alone or they wouldn't want to have to call and wake up their supervisors uh, and the way that the randomization happened was that they pulled an envelope out of a um, out of a container and it th then they opened the envelope and it said tonight you should use the intervention or you should use the control and what happened was was that the envelopes were see-through when held up to the light <laughs> uh, and so they would choose the one where they didn't have to disrupt their superior from their sleep and instead they would do the um, the control that they could do on their own so they were in that manner then um, impacting the rand or jeopardizing the effective randomization of that study so there's all kinds of things that can go wrong or right um, and that's again when in systematic reviews that uh, methods experts are assessing was this they call it randomized but was it actually randomized or is there anywhere that um, it could not be randomized here uh, now for observational studies so randomized control trials are the best most rigorous way of investigating interventional medicine but they're unethical for testing the causes of disease and sometimes uh, many other things Observational studies, in comparison, are a little bit lower, again, on the evidence pyramid. So this is exactly what the title of them is, is this is when you observe, but you make no effort um, to affect the outcome. So an example would be uh, uh, West Nile virus. So you can't, it would never path be ethical to put a whole bunch of, you know, put a bunch of people in a room full of mosquitoes full of West Nile, and then a bunch of other people in a in a room full of mosquitoes without West Nile, and then see what happens. To, you know, to see what happens when people are affected by West Nile virus, you just have to find those people and observe the course of the disease. Um, and so again, sometimes observational studies are the best evidence that you can have available, and sometimes it would be appropriate to have a randomized control trial. Uh, finally, expert opinion. Um, so here's a, a famous cartoon from the New Yorker um, from the 90s, and this is, says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And uh, so this is to say that, you know, sometimes people call themselves an expert or they think they're an expert and not really that they're a dog, but maybe they're not as expert as they claim or seem to be. So we're going to do our final poll here. And we're asking, when is it appropriate to rely on expert opinion? So our last poll of the session. And everybody is so, oh, we're not, we still have a couple people still to vote. So lots of, lots of right answers here. All right, I'm going to close the poll. So those of you that answered, which was most of you, um, the appropriate time to rely on expert opinion is when there aren't any higher forms of evidence. Sometimes there just isn't a good randomized control trial or systematic review or observational study, and that's when you do want to turn to the experts. 
And this is particularly when something is new or in areas where um, it's just a long-standing tried and true practice. Um, uh, or uh, yeah, or when there's um, in in new kinds of in new kinds of things. So always uh, always consult your experts and always be looking to that evidence to inform mm -hmm. your process. Mm -hmm. True experts should be reassessing their own their own knowledge of the subject. Yeah, the really good so, ones will be yeah. quoting and citing all of the um, available evidence. So. At, Getting back to the question we asked at the beginning, um, why should you incorporate evidence into your practice? And so, as, as we've stated throughout and at the beginning, and which most of you knew, is that you need to have your decisions based on something. And you want to make sure you're current, you want to make sure that your decisions are the best decisions that you can possibly make. Um, and you want to make sure that, really, that, that you're able to get the best results. And if you're using evidence-based results and, and you're seeing that there isn't evidence on something, then it may also prompt you to create, like, to, to build that evidence base where it doesn't exist yet. Um, so that's, that's why you do it, to be the best that you can be, basically. Um, and so this is, this is a discussion. Uh, so if you guys could use that comment box again to sort of talk to us about how do you guys incorporate the various levels of evidence into your own work? Um, and we'll just we'll give you a, a few moments here. Um, any any sort of favorite ways to incorporate evidence? Or? Yeah, so some people might um, might stay current in the literature and just kind of read up to make sure, mm -hmm. uh, see if there's anything new coming out. Any kinds of new methods? Mm -hmm. Any kinds so of, sort of questions? Uh, PD days. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so somebody's saying they use up to date and pen. Great resources. Yeah. Health promotion, what works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Others? I know we're starting to get close to lunchtime <laughs> and people are like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's it's never as easy to have these discussions when it's not verbal. It's like, oh I gotta type. <laughs> All right. Uh, support potential demonstration admissions, definitions. Yep, making sure of definitions is a good one. Um, and we know often when people are starting something new or if they're looking to make a change in their program, that's often when they'll take a little bit of, they'll build into their timeline to review the evidence, um, to talk to different experts and mm -hmm. um, associations and people. We've got one here. I read a lot of what comes up in the media and then go back to the source to address the quality. That's a really awesome. good tip. Really um, great. Especially because a lot of times what comes up in the media is not reported effectively. No. Um, <laughs> all those, all those great things like everybody should eat chocolate every day. <laughs> and then it's like it turns out that was just a misinformation campaign or it was a study only done on amoebas or... Okay, keeping up with the journals. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the quality is usually not great from the media as well. Somebody's just commented, mm -hmm. so that's that's definitely true. Um, contact provincial jurisdictions for their standards. All yeah. right, it sounds like you guys are doing a great job of, of keeping evidence in your practice. So that's good. Um, if you have any questions, we'll stay on the line for a little bit. Uh, we unfortunately can't stay on for too long, so if you have a longer question, please email us. There's just Forgive somebody us else in our organization is going to be using the, the GoToWebinar software after us. <laughs> we're not rushing you out. It's just... <laughs> and we're so thankful again that you were able to join us today. We're always looking for feedback on our sessions. Um, specifically, we have our we put our banner up behind us. Um, if you like that or if, you, if it was or distracting just having just this child here. Child. We'd love to hear some feedback on that. If you've got requests for new um, sessions, please let us know. We're about to launch our winter program, um, so we'll be letting Battle Watch for that. And we'll be sending out a really quick survey and also the slides from today. And the handout. Oh, yes, and the handout, of course. So, so that will all be coming. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... So we'll let you sign off or ask questions, yeah. and uh, and again, our thanks. We're gonna just mute ourselves though, oh, okay. until uh, in, unless we get any questions.
So we just had a question, which was, um, why, why do guidelines not use the systematic review process? Um, and so sometimes guidelines do use a systematic process, but not necessarily a systematic review process. Um, and it's kind of a wishy-washy answer, partly because um, sometimes they just aren't great at reporting their methods. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's just the feasibility that to actually do these guidelines, they can't, you know, be searching the entire, they just have to rely more on expert opinion um, than sometimes maybe. Sometimes there have already been many systematic reviews yeah. done on topic and they can pull the information from that as well. And sometimes too, they're collating multiple questions and answers into the guidelines, mm -hmm. and so instead of running 25 systematic reviews, they just have to make it a more meaningful process. Yeah. And so we've got another question. When you work at a systematic level, sometimes you deal with a generic concept that's not necessarily clinically focused. Yeah. Um, what kind of evidence would support that better? And that might be a matter of talking it over with, uh, with us and seeing what are the best review options for that. Yeah. Um, so for instance, if, if you're looking at something and there, you know, if there isn't much information at all, then what you might be needing to put forward is something like a scoping review to say this research needs to be done. Whereas in other cases, you may, you may even be able to do a systematic review with, uh, with more of that qualitative Mm -hmm. kind of study, um, or it may just have to be something more like an evidence review that just, or a literature review that assesses what's there, and that, that's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, unfortunately, there's not, a, there's not a quick and easy answer to that one either. Yeah, it's a, it depends answer. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do a last call for final questions, and again, you can always contact us anytime mm -hmm. um, to chat through more of these or to ask more specific questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks again, everybody, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month for... Predatory Journals. The perils of predatory <laughs> journals. It'll be super dramatic. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.